Eugene, I was watching um, Shuriken the other night on TV and something was missing from the corner. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You weren't there, mate. No, I wasn't able to attend. I, I, I uh, booked myself uh, to speak at my uh, high school's alumni dinner. Um, and uh, so they got booked like a, you know, sometime last year. So I, I, may, I committed to that date long before the Shuriken date. So yeah, my old high school, Massey High School, um, I was just talking at the alumni dinner. Just letting uh, just my old friends and students, the fellow students from way back then, just what I've been up to, blah, blah, blah. And uh, just catching up was really good. My, my time back at school, I'm very fond of. I'm very, um, you know, you, as you get older, you learn to appreciate that time a lot more than perhaps when you're in the moment. And um, I appreciate the teachers that push me teachers that told me off, gave me detentions. Uh, but I most of all appreciate the people that I went to school with. Um, <coughs> yeah, uh, um, I went to school with some wonderful people. And uh, it's a bit sad to me that you lose contact with some of these people because um, my last indelible memory of these people are when they were like, you know, 16 and 17 like I was. So um, every now and then I see someone and I catch up and it's a wonderful feeling, but anyway, that's where I was. And, uh, but, but the Shuriken fights are in good hands. Like, I, I'm being blessed to have a number, you know, some of the most experienced fighters uh, in the country, in the world, and some of the best trainers in the world. So if I have to step out for a night, it's like they're not losing anything by grabbing one of those other trainers. So, um, yeah, I, I wasn't worried. You know, like it's a community thing that you, you I see you do a lot of that sort of thing. You give yeah. back to the community yeah. and um, you're involved in some some good projects at the moment. Yeah, I mean, uh, we, I do, we just launched our Charitable Trust, obviously, the Walk Without Fear Charitable Trust. That's a big one for us because uh, we've been meaning to do that um, since, you know, shortly after a foal obviously passed away and just run into a few roadblocks. And I, I didn't, to be fair, I didn't know how tremendously hard it was to start a charitable trust. Obviously, um, you know, they have to be uh, pretty stringent because there's some uh, tax obligations and stuff that you have to meet. So um, it just took a while and then now we've finally got it up and running. And I think, you know, something like this is something we've been working towards for a while. So everybody's relieved <coughs> that we've got our charitable trust started. And now we can start to do the work that we think is beneficial to society, the work that we think needs done with our own personal kind of flavour and stamp of approval. Can you tell us a little bit about what, what it yeah, is? So the Charitable Trust, we're primarily campaigning against the coward punch and social violence. Um, and, and the number one thing for us is to just bring awareness to it. I don't think a lot of people are educated with around what exactly a coward punch or social violence is. And I don't think they're educated about how prevalent it is. Like we've been, we were inundated when Fong passed away with messages of people's experiences and, uh, in, in terms of them being victims of the um, coward punch. And then we're getting inundated now, now that we've you know, begun our charitable trust. I'm talking hundreds of incidents. And the real, the real problem with those incidents is 90% of them aren't reported. And so you have no idea how many they go on because <coughs> when I was a young fella, yeah, I, I got hit. And, but I just uh, went out for a second, got up, brushed myself out, checked if I was injured and then I went home. But the problem with that is we don't, now, now, now that, because you don't record it, because you don't report it to the police or any authorities, there's no record of it happening, so we don't know how prevalent it is until something like this happens or an incident where someone passes away who's got a slightly higher profile and people start inundating you with all the incidences of them being a victim of the coward punch. It's actually quite horrific. Every week, every weekend, multiple victims in the hundreds getting hit and assaulted uh, by violence and 90% of them not being reported um, because they they, the person who's a victim deems the injuries to just not be significant enough to report, which is, to be fair, the wrong thing to do. But also, you have to understand that yeah. you may have not have much injuries, but 
only takes a really small change in circumstances. You know, the guy punches a little harder, the guy moves the punch an inch higher, the guy uh, drops you in a particular angle, and that your incidents where you've been uninjured is all of a sudden tragic. That's more why it has to be reported. Yeah. So, yeah, that is kind of behind the motivation for us, behind us getting, you know, behind the coward punch and social violence, because it just happens too much. People don't know what it, that it goes on, and we want to make people aware of it, and ultimately advocate for some sort of change. Ultimately, legislative change, that would be the ultimate goal, very hard thing to do. But if we could have coward punch laws, if we could have it singled out, at the moment, coward punch is treated as, you know, under the manslaughter laws, if someone passes away, but if we could have a specific cow and punch law, like they have against strangulation, that would be the ultimate goal. But um, yeah, letting people, making people aware, and then trying to advocate for some sort of change, whether it's just a change in attitude or, or legislative change, something. Yeah. Great cause. Great. Cause. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. One that's close to our heart. Yeah. One that we wish we didn't have to do. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah of course. Um, go back to Shuriken for a moment because you had a good number of fights on the fighters on the card. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I haven't seen the fights, but I had um, I had three girls, which was really cool to see. It's always good to see girls fight. Obviously, they're a minority number in the sport. Um, uh, little dog, Yasmin Knight, uh, Brooke Pritchard, and Mia Evans. And, and they did fantastic. I don't know if all of them won. I think um, I think Brooke won and Mia and the little dog lost. But mate, it's, it's they were all there were no bad losses. They were all great losses. They're just amateur fights, you know. Of course, your goal out there is to win, but the the, the biggest goal of an amateur fight is to learn. Um, and if you can do that off the back of a win, then that's great. But that doesn't always happen. And then I had. Uh, Maynard fight, and then I had Julian and um, Lawrence, and they both won. I think Maynard had a close fight and lost, but again, just an amateur fight. Um, I'm, we want to win, but for, for me, I just want to learn. <laughs> I want them to learn. And Nate, Nate fought from here as well. And Nate as well. Nate as well, who did his training camp with um, Benny Johnson. He, he had a fantastic performance, I heard. But I can't really talk too much because I haven't really seen any footage or anything, to be honest. Just the results. Just the results. But I heard it was another great show. Um, man, we've got to get behind this show, man. Like, um, we've got to just... For this sport to develop, we need sh that show to grow. To grow into something that's just huge so we need more people putting up their hand to be professionals we need less amateurs fighting until they've had 20 amateur fights you don't need 20 amateur fights you need between five and ten turn professional throw your hat in the mix and we need more young people coming through the sport so and that's all done through shows like that so yeah um, you, we were talking off camera before and um, you, you said that on Saturday you went to your old boss Lolo's uh, show and he's still producing the goods. Yeah, Lolo's still doing what he does, right? He takes uh, young, talented uh, kids, predominantly island kids, a lot of them, uh, so full of super talent, full of genetics and just creates these monsters. So. Um, yeah, he's got some young kids that were just amazing, like me and Izzy sat there. Um, and it was just, yeah, mind-blowing. Yeah, mind-blowing. So the future and, you know, the, the in terms of Balmoral League Go is looking strong. And, uh, you know, just like all these other gyms, um, the strength of these gyms dictates how strong combat sports in the future in New Zealand is. So strong gyms means we've got a good future. Thanks for your catch up mate and hopefully we'll get you before you head off to uh, 305. Nah, thank you very much Tony.